Okay, live stream is up. PC recording done. Cloud is done. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Bradley, you may take it away with the opening. Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council's primarily budget hearing on the consumer affairs and business licensing. What at this time, all panelists, please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices all vibrate or in silent mode. If you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, as testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, and we may begin, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Councilmember Diana Ayala, and welcome to the fiscal uh, 2022 preliminary budget hearing for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, known as DCWP. Um, I am the new chair, as you know, of this committee, and this morning we will be reviewing the department's fiscal 2022 preliminary plan. The department's proposed fiscal 2022 expense budget totals 43.1 million, including 28.2 million in city funding to support 408 full-time positions. The budget also includes 15 million in other than personnel services to cover all other general operating costs of the department. Funding for the agency is primarily allocated to resolve consumer and worker complaints, issue numerous licenses, educate and protect consumers, and ensure that the businesses comply with local and state laws. At today's hearing, we will examine the components of DCWP's budget with a particular focus on the department's savings program, budgeted headcount, and funding for the Office of Financial Empowerment. With regard to the department's savings program, I am interested to know whether it will limit the department's ability to carry out its work. We would like to hear uh, about the impact the pandemic has had on the agency's operation and status updates on recent legislation that affects the department, most notably the expansion of the availability of street vendor permits. Specifically, I would like to get an update on how you plan to implement the expansion of the street vendor pro uh, program and the additional resources that will be required. Lastly, we would like to examine the CWP's reporting in the preliminary uh, mayor's management report to gain a better perspective on how well aligned its budget is with its performance. I would like to now welcome the CWP's commissioner, uh, Salas and her team. After, this, after the testimony, members will have the opportunity to follow up with questions for the commissioner. After that, I hope that the commissioner and staff remain and listen to public test of, um, testimony. I look forward to working with the agency and other interested parties in order to finalize the budget over the coming months. In closing, I would like to uh, thank the committee staff for working on putting this hearing together, including Florentine Kabori, John Russell, Stephanie Jones, and Leah, uh, Leah I always have a hard time pronouncing your last name, um, as well as Deputy, uh, I don't wanna mess it up, Leah, so uh, Deputy uh, Chief of Staff, Michelle Cruz, and I will now ask the committee council to please swear in the commissioner. Thank you, Chair. I'm Stephanie Jones, Counsel to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and I will be moderating this budget hearing. Before we begin and before we uh, move to swearing in, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, as it will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your question. For all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Laura Lysalas, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We will also be joined for, for questions by Nick Ratza, Assistant Commissioner of Finance and Administration at DCWP, and Stephen Atanani, Executive Director of External Affairs at DCWP. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Salas. I do. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Ratza. I do. Thank you. Executive Director Etanani. I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Salas to present her testimony. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Ayala and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I am Lorelei Salas, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, also known as DCWP. I am joined by Stephen Etanani, our Executive Director of External Affairs, and Nick Rosa, our Assistant Commissioner of Finance and Administration. It is my pleasure to see you all and testify once again before this committee on behalf of the agency and its budget for fiscal year 2022. Presently, DCWP licenses more than 59,000 businesses and individuals in more than 50 industries. We enforce essential consumer protection, licensing and workplace laws that serve countless New Yorkers and offer programming that increases access in our city to high quality financial services for New Yorkers. I consider this work to be some of the most consequential that comes before the council, particularly as our communities have lived a year of uncertainty and fear, as well as insecure finances, insecure jobs, and unforeseen costs. Today, I will highlight our agency's work throughout this past year, our successes on behalf of consumers and workers, as well as our legislative efforts to make our city more equitable and livable, even as the fundamentals of our life in New York and the country were upended by the pandemic. Lastly, I will close with the challenges we will seek to surmount as an agency and as a city. To frame our conversation today, let me begin by stating that our preliminary budget for the upcoming fiscal year is approximately $43.1 million. For fiscal year 22, our authorized headcount will stand at 408, down 25 since I testified before you last year. And our active headcount is 370. Since our budget hearing last year, we have taken 37,000 consumer complaints, conducted more than 29,000 inspections, completed close to 12,000 financial empowerment appointments, and opened 700 new worker protection cases. Following the states of emergency declared last year by the mayor and the governor and guidance to shelter in place, DCWP found itself thinking about how to best serve our various constituencies. We worked quickly for the safety of our staff and clients to identify the concerns and needs of our small businesses and to offer our services to consumers remotely. One of our first steps was to work with our administration colleagues and then the council to extend the license expiration dates and renewal deadlines for more than 54,000 licensees. Now to supplement the 59 days, the agency routinely provides businesses for their renewal after their license expires. Licensees will also receive an additional 45 days to renew their license after mayoral executive order 107 lapses, totaling 104 days for businesses to renew their licenses. Furthermore, given the many sidewalk cafe licensees were unable to offer dining on premises, DCWP and the council similarly collaborated to waive consent fees for these restaurants use of public sidewalk, saving these businesses more than $12 million this past program year. Throughout the pandemic, we have disseminated this information to businesses through 98,000 inquiries we received online and over the phone. DCWP also developed resources in up to 14 languages to help employers in our city safely reopen, which throughout the state of emergency, um, we distributed at more than 510 outreach events with more than 33,000 attendees, including 33 business education days, three times the number required by local law. In conjunction with our visiting inspector program, our staff has personally visited more than 3,500 individual businesses for one-on-one -on -one in person educational outreach. Additionally, since our licensing center in Manhattan and the city's small business support center in Jamaica reopened in August, 
we have served nearly 5,500 customers while abiding by statewide health and safety guidance. Along these lines, the onset of the pandemic has required us to be nimble and rethink how we provide New Yorkers services, such as financial counseling and coaching and free tax preparation, to name a few. These services traditionally focused on reducing debt, building credit, or developing savings, but in the past year have expanded to also help New Yorkers obtain economic impact payments, determine eligibility for benefits and emergency resources, and seek relief from student loan debt payments. The transition to remote services has required an ongoing education for both our contractor providers and clients in utilizing digital connections and spaces to communicate with one another. The obvious difficulties that exist are principally those of access, especially as many public spaces that we would have previously leveraged, such as our public libraries, have had to close for health and safety concerns. However, to date, we have been able to serve more than 5,000 financial empowerment center clients, and we have seen a rise, uh, a 13% rise in our show rate with clients. In our popular free tax preparation program, New York City Free Tax Prep, we continue to offer online services, although last year's in-person services were by necessity limited by the governor's order to shelter in place at the beginning of March. That said, for the 2021 tax season, we will have nine out of our 15 contracted providers offering in-person and drop-off service at 40 locations across the city. At our last budget hearing, I described to the committee the extraordinary steps we took to declare face masks as a good in short supply during the state of emergency. This, we now know, was just the beginning of endemic price gouging we saw throughout the city of goods that our consumers used to prevent, limit the spread of, and treat COVID-19. To date, we have received more than 12,500 complaints from New Yorkers regarding price gouging since the start of the state of emergency. Just some examples of what we have seen include face masks sold for $50 a packet, or even small individual bottles of hand sanitizer sold for $35 each. I myself personally witnessed a business selling a box of face masks for $200. Imagine a senior in the Bronx spending a huge portion of her benefits just trying to keep her hands clean, or an immigrant worker in Brooklyn spending a chunk of their paycheck to protect themselves from this deadly disease. In our analysis of the complaints we received, the data demonstrates that price gouging occurs in our neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID-19, which are also home to black and brown communities. Based on what our communities have shared, we can tell you that price gouging affects the people who have the least available to lose right now. It brings unpredictable costs to our low-income earners, to our seniors, and to our immigrants in a time when our economic system is fragile. We continue to take in complaints and inspect businesses for compliance on this issue and others, and to do our job on behalf of New Yorkers. Of great pride within the agency is that throughout this pandemic, the protections we enforce on behalf of workers have never wavered nor lapsed, especially in the troubling early months of the pandemic when all the city and its workers felt was insecurity. However, we were of firm belief that this was not the time to place the burdens of public health and fiscal crisis upon those who are most in need. When workers are sick, it is vital that they can stay home without fear of missing a paycheck and to protect themselves, their, their co-workers, their customers, and their employers. A worker needs to know that when they show up ready to work, they will not be unexpectedly, they will not unexpectedly have their schedule changed, depriving them of much needed pay. And workers such as our freelancers need to feel assured that if they do the job, they get paid for the job. Since March, we have received calls from more than 11,500 workers, highlighting how much our city sees, sees DCWP as its resource for information and protection. And in the past year, amid reduced employment and intense financial insecurity, we have secured $1.25 million in restitution for 1,300 workers who had their rights violated. This is our mission on behalf of New Yorkers to ensure that these protections that the administration and the council have established over the past seven years have a meaningful impact in our city. 
To put this into context, late, late last year, our former chair, Council Member Cohen, and local 338 or of RWDSU conducted the agency, um, contacted us regarding 19 workers at a local grocery store who had been illegally fired by their new employer. 19 essential workers who worked the entire pandemic to help feed their community. We worked this case and we were able to get those workers their jobs back and to get them $90,000 in restitution for their back wages. More importantly, our partnership with the council extends beyond referrals for enforcement of consumer and workers' rights, but also to the legislation that forms the basis, the still trusses of those rights. Local Law 97 of 2020 is one such piece of legislation whereby the city updated its paid safe and sick leave law to match state standards and ensure that all paid care workers, those workers in our homes that care for our elderly, our children, or help maintain our households in other ways, have the same rights to leave accrual and leave use as any other private sector worker in the city. As a former paid care worker myself, I thank you all for recognizing this work. Last August, the council and the administration also successfully enacted Local Law 80, which officially changed the name of our agency to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and enshrined key protections, such as the rights of our consumers and workers to equitable relief and restitution across all our laws. Simultaneously, we worked with the state legislature and ultimately the governor's office to enact a law empowering the agency to docket civil court judgments that award New Yorkers restitution. This long-standing priority helps the agency level the playing field for owners, businesses, and affected consumers. It strengthens our ability to secure for New Yorkers monetary and other relief that they were awarded against businesses that violated the city's consumer protection law, municipal workplace laws, and licensing laws. Next on our legislative agenda, as many of you know, remains introduction 1622, our priority to modernize the consumer protection law for the 21st century. And here I'd like to thank Council Member Chin and Chair Ayala and other members of the committee for your ongoing support of this legislation. Intro 1622, guarantees consumers common sense protections for their transactions that occur on the internet or that, are, or that are completed in languages other than English. It also importantly adjusts for inflation the civil penalties for violating the CPL. Our foundation, uh, agency's foundational law has been a centerpiece of our city's obligation to protect our constituents from harm and deception since 1969. In particularly, um, our city seniors, immigrants, black and brown communities, and others. Today's penalties under the CPL are already among the lowest uh, consumer protection penalties in our country, reflecting an economy in 1969 when the minimum wage was $1.30 an hour. And we all agree that when it comes to protecting vulnerable New Yorkers, up-to-date penalties make sense such as the penalties in council's recent legislation to protect our small businesses from unreasonable delivery app fees, to require businesses to disclose their collection of biometric data, or to require hotels to report their service disruptions. Businesses that seek to derive profit from deceiving New Yorkers should not be allowed to operate with impunity in our city. We as a city need to strengthen now more than ever the fundamental law that protects everyday New Yorkers who are suffering during this crisis of financial instability and unforeseen costs. We look forward to council taking up 1622 as a standalone bill or including its key provisions in the small business relief package. This past year has also brought new responsibilities and protections for us to uphold on behalf of New Yorkers. Just cause rights for our city's 70,000 fast food workers. Legislation championed by council member Lander represent the next forward step in our fight for an equitable and livable city for our residents. As we mentioned at our legislative hearing to enforce worker protections, especially the, these in a whole new field of work requires additional personnel for outreach, implementation, intake, investigations, and litigation. 
And this law requires not only administrative enforcement by DCWD, but also the creation of an entirely new arbitration program for resolving wrongful discharge disputes. Setting up and staffing these operations are necessary to ensure that businesses understand how to comply with the law and that we have the ability to protect workers who are illegally dismissed. Another new area of work is the Office of Street Vendor Enforcement, which Council's legislation requires to be operational by September 1st of this year. We anticipate being uh, officially designated with the legal authority of this office shortly and are preparing ourselves and our resource needs for the task at hand. In order to enforce street vending for more than 2,000 general vendor licensees and 5,000 food vendor permittees, as well as at least another 13,000 unlicensed vendors, we believe a fully staffed office will require new resources over the next four fiscal years. What we know from our small businesses, both street vendors and brick and mortar establishments, is that they want responsible and fair enforcement, not the, not the same unaccountability and disparate heavy handedness of the past. We have begun working with OMB to ensure these resources are included as part of the upcoming fiscal year 22 executive budget in order for the Office of Street Vendor Enforcement to have the capacity in place to do this work the right way with standards of success that New Yorkers expect and that this agency has brought to its other facets of work. So much has changed in the past year since many of us sat together at City Hall unknowing of the altered course our lives and our city would take. However, we as New Yorkers have never been ones to give up. I am truly proud to say that this agency is but a, but a micro, my, microcosm of that spirit and one that is dedicated to creating real change, to creating real protections and to creating real equity for New Yorkers. It is my honor to partner with this council and this administration in protecting New Yorkers today and in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll now turn it over to Chair Ayala to acknowledge council members who are present here today. I'm having a hard time muting and unmuting. Um, so I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Koo, Kalo, Jaeger, Brennan, Koslowitz, and Chen. I'm not sure that I, I'm, I'm just going to double check and make sure I didn't miss anyone. I don't think that I have. I don't think so. Oh, council member Manchaka, there you go. I see you in the little box. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Welcome. What a morning. What a morning. So I guess the, the, the first question should probably be, I mean, in the midst, in the midst of this, this pandemic and, and all of the challenges that, you know, that it, it, it's brought and, I, you know, thank you, um, because in your testimony, um, you referenced your work with RWBSU and, and some of their, um, their members. Um, and I, you know, I really appreciate that because I, you know, I can only imagine um, how many essential workers have been discharged, um, and we don't, you know, we may not even know that number, right, for the next year or so. Um, but I'm sure that this has had a, a long-standing effect, um, even deeper than we, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we know of today. So, you know, your, the budget is 43.2 million. In, in your opinion. Is that budget sufficient to fulfill the agency's mandate or any additional resources that may be needed in the year to come? Ariella, I, I appreciate the question. Um, thank you. I, you know, our headcount has decreased over the years while our mandates have actually grown. Um, uh, as you know, in the last six months, we've been charged with um, setting up the Office of Street Vending Enforcement and with uh, a new law that we need to enforce, just, just, cause, just cause protections, which is the type of law that exactly would protect workers like the, the ones from the Bronx grocery store that were dismissed unfairly. So we certainly will need significant staff um, resources to do this work well. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, to date, uh, we have been able to uh, put our resources to address the most urgent needs of New Yorkers, and we will continue to do that. Um, so, um, yes, we will always welcome additional resources. Uh, currently, we are working with OMB to um, be able to um, get approvals to fill some of our vacancies um, and, and to have an operational office of speed pending enforcement by the deadline of implementation, which is September this year. So how much do you anticipate that you will need for additional resources to be able to meet all of those mandates? Uh, you know, I know that my office has submitted uh, fiscal impact statements for both the street vending enforcement work and the just cause legislation. Uh, currently, uh, we have uh, been able to designate existing inspectors to do some of this work, right? So we had four inspectors in the field since, um, since the legislation passed in late February. We are in the process of getting another four more in the field. And again, discussions with OMB are ongoing. I know the administration is fully committed to seeing us do this work well. Okay. Now, could you share a little bit about how the pandemic has led to any long-term changes in, in, the, in the budget planning process? Um, I, you know, what I would say in terms of our um, response to the pandemic, uh, you know, we have, basically try to maintain the same level of service to the public uh, with our existing resources. We have um, had to adapt our services to be conducted virtually, right, for the most part. A lot of our work continues to be in the field also, um, but there aren't necessarily right now any um, any current asks in terms of budget in order to adapt to the pandemic, right? Uh, we've used our existing resources and uh, what we have done instead has been to adjust our services in a way that um, promotes, um, you know, when a licensee comes into our space, for instance, they need to make an appointment to see us. So we've used our current OTPS budget to fund some of the, the um, like the, the fixes we needed to do in order to adapt to this. Has any of, has, has any of that budget gone towards education campaigns? Um, you know, in, I, I know that, you know, obviously, um, for some of the small businesses, even with the, um, outdoor, uh, dining opportunities, there was a lot of confusion citywide. Um, I'm sure that in terms of worker protections, right, that you have, um, you know, businesses and, um, employers who may be, um, taking advantage of workers. Has there been any attempt to mount some sort of even virtual uh, campaign to, to better educate consumers and workers around uh, laws that protect them? Well, you know, traditionally in our budget, we've had some um, uh, funding designated to public awareness campaigns, right? Uh, this, during the pandemic, uh, we focused a lot on doing outreach to our communities in person. Um, a lot of the businesses that needed to understand how to comply with the safety and health guidelines actually uh, you know, received one-on-one -on -one visits from our office. Um, we conducted 33, as I mentioned in my testimony, 33 business education days. Um, and we've seen um, almost 33,000 businesses with like one-to-one -to -one touches via those um, uh, business education days, via our round tables. Um, a lot of, um, again, the effort has been on connecting one-on-one -on -one with New Yorkers. Um, you know, there was a period of time when we didn't have a lot of um, um, public use of the subways and the buses. So putting a campaign like that on subways and buses would not have been effective then. So um, we'll continue to think about our outreach strategy. And um, to date, we've, you know, um, spent dollars both in our traditional media but also our ethnic media to make sure that our businesses and our workers and consumers know what the rights are and how to get to us. Okay. In the preliminary budget, the CWP uh, will generate a budgetary sa savings of 509,000 in the fiscal year 2021 uh, through the hiring and attrition management program, which allows for one replacement for every three employees lost through attrition. The program is anticipated to reduce the headcount by 31 positions across the department. 
How, uh, I think you mentioned that you have, I think it's a 25 vacant positions now. Is that, is that correct? Um, so our actual vacancies are 38. 38. We are down 25 headcount from uh, the previous fiscal year. Okay, and what is the, the impact to operations at DCWP? You, you, we've always tried to uh, spread our savings uh, across the agency. So there's not one particular division that may have seen the savings, right? They're spread in a way where we maximize uh, preserving our services to the public. So um, as of right now, we are actually working with OMB uh, so that the agency will be exempt from the three uh, for one rule and will be able to fill those vacancies and not be subject to that particular restriction. But I'm, I'm assuming that there has to have been some sort of impact, right? Because I, you, you know, we, you, you've had to pivot to, you know, um, a different type of service now, right? And where we have to be a little bit more uh, aggressive uh, in our campaigns, even if you're doing, you know, face-to-face uh, -face time with small businesses, I'm assuming that absorbs a lot of, you know, personnel time. So what, what has been the impact of the reduction in staff? Mm -hmm. So I, um... So traditionally, there's always do. Um, I know. I mean, I see that you're trying to make do with what you have, but I mean, is is that is that creating you know is that creating an issue within the the, the agency? Yes. I mean, obviously, you know, if your budget does not change year after year and you get additional mandates, we are uh, in the position to have to prioritize our work, right? And, and focus on the most urgent needs of New Yorkers. That is the case. Uh, I, I do have to say that for us, our major funding concerns will be making sure that we have the sufficient funding to both staff the Office of Street Vendor Enforcement and to also staff the work at the Office of Labor Policy and Standards to do the just cause uh, investigations. Um, and um, we will always welcome additional funding, right? We will not say no, we, we can do more with more funding, obviously. Um, but as of right now, uh, you know, to give you an example, um, following uh, the March state of emergency, right? Our inspections were mostly focusing on responding to price gouging and complaints and to conducting business reopening inspections. So, you know, it, at times we will have to just uh, um, take measures to make sure that the, the resources are put into areas where we really, what New Yorkers need us most, right? So yes, um, um, certainly we could use more funding to, to do more work, to get to more New Yorkers. Um, but uh, I would say our focus right now is on working with OMB to get the resources for the Office of Street Vending Enforcement and Just Cause. We wanna help you with that. Thank you. Um, and we've been joined by Council Member Lander who smiled because he wants to get you more money too. <laughs> um, according to the preliminary plan, um, DCWP's contract budget totals 1.8 million for six contracts. Can you talk about the process by which DCWP selects its vendors and is there any contract being issued to minority and women business uh, enterprises? So the majority of our contract work, and I'm going to ask my, um, my colleagues to help me if there's anything that needs to be added, but most of the contracts that we have are under our Office of Financial Empowerment, uh, which is the office that runs the programs for financial counseling and coaching and um, the free tax preparation services, which, uh, you know, obviously we're in the middle of tax season right now. So that's very important work. We have um, seven um, providers for um, financial coaching and 15 for uh, free tax preparation services. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, most of, again, most of the funding there goes to towards providing services to New Yorkers. Um, and um, am I cor correct, Nick and Steve, with the number of providers? Yep. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, um, again, those services are really key for New Yorkers. And, you know, the goal is really to make sure that they improve their financial health and that they are able to use the services at no cost. Um, so um, I, I believe, and I'm gonna say this and, and please correct me, Nick, but um, because our contracts are with nonprofit uh, providers, 
uh, you know, they are not really included as part of the MD, MWBE numbers, right? Uh, but many are run by uh, minority individuals. They're just not included because uh, they don't fit the definition of uh, M MWBEs. But what is, what is the so what does the vendor selection process look like? I don't know. If I missed oh, that. sure. Yes, uh, it's via uh, requests for um, okay. RFPs. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And and you know the one thing that I would just say about this because uh, it's I think it's very important to to note that our um, financial counseling centers are located in many of the 35 neighborhoods where we know um, have been the same neighborhoods that have been highly impacted by COVID-19. These are also traditionally neighborhoods where we have a lot of unbanked and underbanked individuals, right? And so when we put out the RFP, we do ask, uh, you know, contractors were declined to provide services and the location is part of the criteria. But we want to make sure we are in those neighborhoods neighborhoods where services are needed most. I mean I, I will I will say that since I've been on the committee that I have been really pleasantly surprised by the number of you know projects and, and programs that are run through this uh, this agency. Um, what I, and I, you know, I've been advertising them very heavily because I think that they're, they're services that really benefit my constituency. The only thing that I would say is that sometimes, you know, some of our nonprofits are really stressed, right? And um, that marketing piece is very difficult for them. And so not, you know, it, it, not as many people are aware sometimes, right, of these services. And so, you know, if, if there was a way to maybe kind of help work through that with them or um ensure that's part of the rfp process right is what is the educational the local educational campaign to ensure that we're putting in resources right to financial literacy so that you know the community is actually benefiting from it because they know where to find it if you know if something happens so um i think you know those those profits working with other nonprofits is really uh, it's essential but also recognizing that that they're limited also in terms of what they can and cannot do so um even with the best of intentions sometimes um it becomes difficult to really help advertise everything that we're doing um in a more holistic way. Um, I want to just take a minute because I know I, I, I want to recognize um, that Councilman Richard is here and I'm not sure if she's next. So I don't want to ask any of the questions on the street vendor uh, bill because I want to leave those for her. Um, but I want to recognize my colleagues for a minute and then I'll come back uh, to uh, my next one of questions. If I'm, oh. Yes, yes, no, go ahead. Oh, if I just may say that, um, yes, that you bring up a really good point. And we often do um, make sure that our uh, you know, we have obviously the money that goes to the providers, but we also have some funding that we use to do public awareness campaigns. So in the past, we have put together, uh, you know, posters and flyers on the subways and buses. You may still see some of them around financial counseling. Um, and we have them in certain languages, depending on the neighborhoods. You know, if we have new neighborhoods, we try to go there to make sure that uh, consumers and workers know that we have a presence in those neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah, no, I and and we'd be happy to help with that as well. So if you have any any literature or posters or you know information that you would like uh, disseminated throughout the local community, um, that that's helpful. I usually, I, you know, I, I try to treat my office. I have a, a waiting area, and I have is kind of like a self service station because I remember being out in the community right when I was a a young mother and having to go like to the WIC program and, and, and running into really valuable, helpful information, just sitting there in the waiting area while I'm reading through some of their literature. I'm like, oh, wow, this is a program that I didn't even know existed, but really, you know, could really help me. Um, so I think that sometimes, you know, just, I, you know, I get the subways and in the buses are, you know, are, are popular uh, place for advertisement. But I think that there are, you know, many New Yorkers that you know, don't travel every single day or may not be reading you know, um, what's what's there. So, uh, you know, I, I, we'll come back around to a second round of questions, but I want to allow some some time for my colleagues to have some time as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, to call in council members in order, first we have council member Koo, followed by council member Kozlowitz and then council member Chen. A reminder uh, to keep your questions to five minutes, including answers, and the sergeant will begin the timer and let you know when you can begin. Uh, Councilmember Koo. Thank, Thank you. 
Commissioner Charles, thank you for coming to testify today. Uh, remember I talked to you a few weeks ago about vending in Fashion downtown. Uh, I want to ask you, since then, have the agency uh, done anything to improve um, the, uh, the unlicensed vending problem in downtown Flushing? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Council Member, for your question. And, and yes, of course, I remember us uh, speaking about this issue in Flushing. Uh, we have gone to Flushing. We went shortly after that, I believe maybe a few days or a week after we spoke. Um, and we brought our inspectors to do both, talk to vendors about uh, street vending rules and regulations, but also about social distance guidelines, right? I, I know that you are very concerned about the rising numbers of COVID-19 in Flushing. So um, uh, we, we, we did that. Um, I have to tell you also that since, um, since the end of February, we've visited over a hundred, um, we paid over 100 business to vending corridors. So our office is already responding to concerns and questions and calls from elected officials and also bids. Uh, and we are, um, you know, doing outreach and education for the vending community. Um, from my personal observation, because I walk on the streets every day, I do not see any improvements at all. It's still the same amount of vending, vending problems, no? So I don't know what you have done. No. I mean, you, we have to do something. Otherwise, the people think the city is dysfunctional. We have, you don't provide service to the constituents here. Service means quality of life too. I'm not blaming you alone. If you cannot do things by yourself or by your agency, you should call up the mayor and say, hey, we need NYPD, we need sanitation, we need Department of Health to uh, do things to, together to, to uh, get rid of yes. this unlicensed and un unsanitary vendors on the street because it's causing traffic problems, pedestrian, they have a hard time to walk. I mean, sidewalks are designed for people to walk, not for vending. This is not a third world country. You bring up a good point. I, I forgot to mention that um, certainly, you know, in Flushing, we did observe uh, some activity that actually uh, was taking place in transit areas, such as I believe was Long Island Railroad uh, property um, or space, and, and also potentially issues with uh, the sale of counterfeit goods. I, I just want to clarify that while our office uh, will be housing the street vending enforcement of um, the time, place, and manner restrictions, we will also have other agencies play a role in enforcement for certain issues, right? So you are absolutely right that in some cases, PD will have to intervene for some of the issues I mentioned. Uh, Department of Health will continue to do uh, sanitary inspections of food vending. Parks Department will have a role and so will DOT. So certainly those agencies continue to have a role. Um, and, you know, we will be convening our uh, street vendor advisory board, which is made up of those uh, agencies and additionally, the stakeholders that are both nominated by the administration, by the council, um, that stakeholders on both sides, the business side and the street vendor advocate side, that uh, initial uh, board meeting will happen before the end of April. Yeah, but, but Commissioner, you we're not starting this office till September, when it's like six months away. Even by September, it will take a few months to hire all these people, right? To, to, so, so it's like a whole year without enforcement. Oh, let me, so how yeah. can you leave a city like that? So let me, first uh, let me I say. I mean, that this is, no, 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 no. To, uh, you are our wish of the common people. People want enforcement on the streets. They want some place they can walk safely. They don't want to walk on the street and they don't want to want to catch COVID-19 because the, the sign was so congested. This is common sense. This is, a, what do you mean? If you cannot do it, tell the mayor, hey, I cannot do it, right? Or somebody else do it. So you cannot just leave it like, 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 like no, no action. So let me, we, let me also, we, need, yeah. we need to see some results. Let me clarify something about I mean, them. I walk on the streets and people complain to me every day. So 
He is a cool. What happened to you? You didn't do anything on side on the sidewalk congestions. This is that over a year already. I've been campaigning. <clears throat> so 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 even with the new new office um, set up, how many agents you want to hire? You will hire. So uh, right now, uh, I think I mentioned this. Uh, we have four dedicated inspectors since uh, since uh, February, and we have another four that will be added to that. Um, I, I just also want to say that while council gave us until September to set up the office, um, it is not accurate that enforcement will not start before. We are already uh, planning on enforcement sometime starting in May. Uh, we have, though, right now, a plan for outreach and education that we think is very important uh, to conduct for our street vending community. Uh, it is the same way in which we try to uh, serve our brick and mortar businesses where we have both outreach and education and also enforcement. So the office will be fully operational in September, but in the meantime, we already have enforcement resources and we've already been conducting business uh, visits to certain uh, business um, street vending corridors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we have Council Member Kozlowitz followed by Council Member Chen. Council Member Kozlowitz. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Nice seeing you. Um, how many inspectors do you have total throughout the whole city? Um, thank you for your question. We have about 46 inspectors, I believe, um, throughout the city. Um, to conduct all of our, who are on the ground, right? We have a few additional supervisors who work from the office, um, but it's about 46 inspectors. And while I look for it, if anyone in my staff has a number at hand, if you can mention it. Yeah, that number is generally right. Um, there are supervising and uh, supervising, inspecting staff that, you know, brings the, the total active headcount to around 78 citywide, but again, as the commissioner mentioned, not all 78 uh, in that headcount are in the field per se doing- uh, Okay, do you have package. them broken down in boroughs? So the let us mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so a couple of things. We have first a team that works on tobacco enforcement. Uh, we actually, as an agency, re receive funding from the state to do tobacco enforcement. Um, and we have, um, like I said, about four inspectors right now doing general vending, and we have the borough enforcement that includes 18 inspectors. Um, they, um, you know, inspect, inspect for licenses, requirements, and laws across the city. In each bar, in each uh, bar, in, for instance, um, Queens. Queens has 18 inspectors. No, 18 is the total number of inspectors that would do general. Um, patrol inspections across the city. Um, some of our tobacco enforcement inspectors obviously are also inspecting businesses across the city. So I don't know, Steve, if we have a dedicated number to Queens. I don't believe we do. Because they used to have a designated number to Queens. In fact, they were located in uh, Borough Hall in Queens. And they yes. were there, well, they had an office there and any complaints, they were able to go out and inspect, you know, whatever complaints there were. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that anymore. We, the team that used to be located at the Borough Hall is now using the office space that we have in the Queen's Small Business Center location, which is in Jamaica, right? So there are a number of inspectors who are there in Queens. I don't have the number, uh, it's 18 is the total, right? For the city but i do not know the exact number in queens um so um someone is telling me that is in our time <laughs> so you would say that you certainly need more inspectors you know especially if you know since covid uh and all the issues that are out there um, would you say that you would need more inspectors in your budget well, so right now, like I mentioned, we are working with OMB to secure uh, approvals for additional vacancies in our enforcement team. Um, and we are working towards 
you know, being able to be fully staffed for the street vending enforcement office. Um, um, again, um, you know, we, with the resources we have, uh, we do the best we can and we prioritize the issues that are causing most harm to consumers and workers. Uh, but yes, we haven't had an increase in the number of inspectors over the years. It's the number stays uh, the same throughout the years? Yes. Well, that's not a good thing. There were, you know, more issues, and especially now with the, you know, COVID, there are a lot more issues that, you know, have to be looked at. Yes, uh, yes, I understand. Obviously, we are, uh, we'll continue to work with the council, the administration, um, making sure that uh, we are, again, having a presence and addressing the concerns of New Yorkers. Uh, but yeah, the number of inspectors have be, has been steady. Yeah, that, that's not a good thing. Um, also, you said at the beginning that you had uh, thousands of complaints. Was there one specific complaint that came in more than any other complaint? Yes. Um, so price gouging, uh, we received over 12,500 price gouging complaints since March last year. That is a very big number. Uh, we generally average average in a year 10,000 or so complaints. So 12,500 complaints just on price gouging was uh, a huge volume for us. Um, and uh, that is the area in which our inspectors used the most I mean, uh, responding to that. Is there one specific complaint more than any other of, of the complaints? Uh, the price gouging was about um, excessive pricing for on face masks, on hand sanitizers, uh, alcohol, you know, rubbing alcohol, those types of products. Okay, because that's, you know, that's a big number of complaints. And, and with all, you know, the little amount of inspectors that are around that, you know, it's very hard to take care of 12,500 complaints with the uh, you know, 18 inspectors. Um, I will just also say um, two things. So I'm told that we have four inspectors in Queens. So there are four that are dedicated to Queens. Um, the other thing that I want to just clarify also that with respect to COVID-19 work, so outside of price gouging, right? We did um, also work with the Office of Special Enforcement in, in the city to respond to COVID-19 type of complaints regarding business reopening, right? So that is an area in which we conducted 12,000 uh, inspections in the field uh, in response to complaints from New Yorkers or concerns. Um, so that is another area that took a lot of our resources. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Kozlowitz. And now we have Councilmember Chen. Time starts now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to our chair and uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your leadership in this department. I know that responsibility has grown and um, you're doing a lot more with less and we want to make sure that we fight for the resources so that your agency continue to, uh, to grow and, and to really be the advocates for workers and consumers. Um, I, I looked at your, um, I mean, your headcount. It's kind of like already you're down 38 and then you have extra responsibility. I mean, that, that's, that's not right to begin with. Right, you're just supposed to be budgeted for four four hundred and eight, and then you're down to three hundred and seventy, and they're not letting you hire people. I mean, that should not be the case at all. Uh, my question to you is on line uh, first is on language access, um, the capacity of the agency to be able to communicate uh, with businesses and vendors in a language that they understand, so they know what the rules are. Um, so how is that uh, in terms of the capacity of your agency on that? Uh, the other thing is that with the vendor um, enforcement, I know that you started with four people. That's not enough to go around to the whole city. Uh, 
<clears throat> it's just impossible. I know that you had started to do uh, just education and outreach, but as you know, the frustration that you hear from council member Koo is that, yes, you can do the education outreach, but there's gotta be some enforcement connected to it, especially with an area where there is kind of all these issues. So the second question is that, how do you work with the other agency? Like if there were people selling food product on the street um, that is unsanitary, like, are you referring, are you calling Department of Health to tell them that they should visit, you know, the street because this is what's happening over there. Um, and definitely looking at the pictures, uh, there was no social distancing at all. I mean, they were like one next to the other. Uh, so I think we have to make sure that while you're doing the education, which is great, but they also should have enforcement capacity with the other agency, because NYPD used to do it. And when the mayor took that responsibility out of their hand and gave it to you, uh, to your agency, it doesn't mean that NYPD shouldn't be helpful either. So I guess in terms of the, the coordination uh, with that, um, so if you can address those, the language issue and, and then with the, uh, the enforcement unit. Thank you for your questions, uh, Council Member Chin. So a couple of things on local law 30 language access. Uh, I just wanna say that we have been audited by the controller's office. We are fully in compliance of the, license, um, the language access requirements pursuant to city law, but we often exceed that, right? We actually have materials translated into 14, 16, 20 languages, uh, depending on the case. Um, I also have to say our office has always emphasized access to New Yorkers. We even have oral translations of five indigenous languages, most commonly uh, spoken in New York City. So that is for us a very important piece of our work to make sure that our laws and uh, the protections and the responsibilities uh, are clear in as many languages as possible. Um, our staff, obviously, if we don't have um, if we don't have the services in a particular language, we all have access to language line, uh, but we try to be very thorough in making sure that our materials are translating into as many languages as possible. Um, in terms of street vending, um, certainly I, you know, like I said, there will be a role for other city agencies, right? Depending on the issue uh, that is present in, in a particular hotspot. And please, I do want to encourage council to work with us in calling us and telling us if you see in your districts, are there areas that you want us to, to go check out to mm -hmm. visit? Um, I, I believe that both street vendors and businesses want to comply. The majority of them want to comply mm -hmm. with the laws, right? And we're here to provide them with the tools they need to do that successfully. So I do believe that for the majority of street vendors and businesses, we will see compliance once they understand what their obligations are. Uh, and in the, there will be case, cases in which enforcement is needed. Um, now, again, um, our enforcement will begin to take place in May after we spend a, few weeks doing a lot of outreach and education, um, and it will um, require us to talk to other city agencies. We will have an internal working group also um, and already are putting together and have been in contact with uh, staff of the Department of, Department of Health and DOT and other agencies to, make, to address that issue of like there will be cases in which other agencies will have to act and come, come with us or go separately. Um, but that process is uh, being planned right now. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that and really appreciate uh, your leadership and your agent's leadership in taking up uh, this important role. Um, but I think the other agency also need to step up. And I guess as it go along, if, if there are issues coming up where you're not getting the support or the cooperation, let us know because we wanna make sure that your work um, is successful because you're doing the right thing uh, for our community and for the street vendors. So we wanna make sure, and I, I've heard from community board um, that your staff is already doing presentation and letting them know that you are doing education and I was first letting people know what the rules are and then enforcement will, will come later. And we really uh, appreciate that. Thank so thank you. you, thank you chair. Thank you for your support. 
And now, Chair, I'll turn it back over to you if you have any additional questions. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner, if I, if I missed this in, uh, in, in your responses to Council Member Chen's um, questions, but uh, can you share again, how many additional staff are you gonna, uh, is, is there, uh, are you intending to hire for the implementation of this uh, street vendor legislation? So um, uh, I mentioned that we had put together uh, fiscal impact statements, right? Um, and uh, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, we were looking in the neighborhood of between 40 to 60 uh, lines to be used to do this work. Uh, right now, we are, uh, we have four in the field already, four that are in the process of either maybe getting hired or starting soon. So that's eight. Uh, we hope that by September uh, this year, we'll have additional resources, but this is uh, an ongoing discussion, and I know that the administration is committed to working with us to make sure that we have the resources needed for this work. That's 40 to 60 new hires? Well, that is what we estimated when we did an analysis of the, the legislation, uh, of the requirement to inspect 75% you know, of licensees, right? And so uh, it is. it includes, it's not just inspectors, obviously. We need attorneys who in many cases will represent the agency at oath. We need outreach staff, right? It, this is, um, in, and also with licensing, I know that we'll, we'll eventually have to increase the number of licenses. So that is that takes into account the, the entire process, not just the inspectors. You can expect seven to eight inspectors over the next couple of months to be hired, dedicated to vending enforcement. And education, right? I'm assuming. The education. So... Yeah, I mean, I just want to like zoom out a little bit in terms of like the the vending law and all that. Like the Office of Street Vendor Enforcement is a multi-jurisdictional uh, kind of effort by the agency. It borrows from different divisional work. I represent external affairs, for example. My team of community associates uh, are already going to be out in the field doing education compliance. In some cases, inspectors join uh, as part of the commissioner's, uh, you know, one of her signature programs, this visiting inspector program, some inspectors are trained uh, to do, uh, you know, highly detailed uh, inspector education. Um, mostly, though, the in, when we're talking about it in patrol inspections and enforcement hires, those are going to be the, the folks that are going out. And for example, uh, issuing notice of hearings um, and addressing any unlawful activity in the field. Uh, the outreach stuff mostly uh, contained in the external affairs world. And as the commissioner mentioned, there's other types of work, including attorney work that would be involved that would implicate our general counsel division um, as such. But in terms of what we have now, we have four dedicated inspectors uh, for vending. That number would increase to about seven or eight over the next couple of months. And we're working with OMB uh, to attain additional resources. It's a modest amount. Um, you know, the mandate is broad, as you know, Chair, full to, to be continuing to work with the administration and the council to continue to augment our staffing so that we can reach that 75% number that is mandated in the law in terms of, uh, you know, number of vendors that, that proportionally that we have to visit citywide. Yeah, I know. I, I recognize that enforcement is a big, you know, part of this whole process and that it's it's necessary, but I think that the educational campaign is just as, as equally as necessary because, you know, most of, you know, a lot, well, a, a great percentage of street vendors happen to be, you know, uh, mostly primarily immigrant women, right? And you know, many of them were really seriously impacted by the COVID pandemic. And so we don't want to further compound, you know, on all of the things that they've already been dealing with by, you know, enforcing, um, heavily enforcing, um, you know, street vending until we've had an opportunity to better educate them, right, on what's to come and, and, and the opportunities that, you know, that will be afforded to them in the next couple of years. So, I think that, you know, for, I know that for me and I'm, and I'm, and you know, I, I don't want to speak for council member, for the other council members here, at council member Chen, but this has really been uh, an important focal point of these conversations is really, you know, educating people because, you know, we have four, we have four um, inspectors out on the street right now. And, 
you know, we're, we're going to triple, quadruple, you know, the amount of, of enforcement officers that are going to be out in the street, um, it's going to be a significant change. Um, so they should be prepared for that. They should understand what that means and not be fearful of it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. Now, in, in, the, in the 40 to 60 uh, headcount uh, number, do you have a breakdown of what that would look like to you, you know, to you as of today, you know, the number of attorneys versus the number of inspectors versus the number of, you know, outreach staff? Um, Chair, I don't have the, the breakdown in front of me. We will be happy to provide you with that information. Um, I just want to say that I uh, thank you for your comment. We actually have had meetings with different stakeholders. Uh, when we met with the leadership from the Restaurant Association in New York City, they actually expressed the same sentiments about being concerned that you know, a lot of their former employees who had to be let go during the pandemic were now unemployed and were resorting to vending because that was the only option they had to put food on the table. And they themselves wanted us to take a very, uh, you know, soft approach to enforcement, especially during the pandemic, right? So, so I know uh, we will definitely be stressing that uh, we want to be there to partner with vendors too and to make sure they understand their obligations and to have those materials in their languages so that they know what to expect from an inspection. Right. Um, Michelle, you, you brought up a good point because, you know, I, I recently heard from a colleague that there was a small business in their uh, district that went out of business because of the pandemic. And so now this business owner has resorted to street vending in front of what used to be his place of business. Is that is that a, a common theme? Like, are you seeing, uh, you know, a lot of this happening? And, you know, what, if anything, are we, you know, able to do to help these, uh, these small business owners through this crisis? So, uh, certainly, you know, the numbers that we have of the estimates of vending and uh, vendors in the streets, the 20,000 was before the pandemic, right? We don't really have a number right now of what, you know, how many street vendors we have in New York City streets. So, Part of our like initial few weeks of doing this work is also looking at where are the new hotspots, right? Where do we have the most congestion in sidewalks, right? Like you guys remember uh, cool referred to, we, we want to make sure the public can walk through those sidewalks, right? So, so we're looking at that. Uh, and we've heard anecdotally, I don't have numbers, but we've heard anecdotally from different people that yes, people who were not vending before are vending now. Um, and that is why we want to make sure that at least uh, for the next two months, we are doing purely educational, you know, outreach um, to make sure that, again, the vendors have the information they need to, uh, to be in compliance. Okay. okay. Um, and do we have any idea when the, um, when, when conversations will start about the uh, convening of the advisory committee? Yeah, I believe that our uh, mayor's office of appointments will be working with council about uh, figuring out um, which, um, um, you know, which stakeholders will be nominated by council, right? It, it's either four or six stakeholders that need to be nominated by the council. Um, yes, yeah, right? that's, that's right. Um, so right now, uh, for the past several months, and honestly, almost the day after the council passed uh, the local law, we have received uh, nominations from stakeholders, um, from, from different groups, elected officials, things like that for different nominations to this board. Um, for us, uh, meaning the administration, the administration will nominate four people to the board, two of which that are representative of the small business community, two representative of the vendor constituency. The speaker is charged with nominating six. That, in, inclusive of that six include uh, uh, small business as well as vendor constituencies, as well as other stakeholders that the administration is not responsible for, for nominating. So there is some overlap. And as the commissioner mentioned, uh, you know, there will be um, engagement with the council um, to ensure that the nomination process is coordinated, um, you know, with the mayors of appointments and, um, and with the speaker's office. In terms of the advisory board itself, it's required to meet by April 28th. We're on schedule for that. Um, and, you know, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, beginning that work as soon as possible. Okay, that's helpful because we've been getting a lot of calls around that. Um, okay. Uh, 
uh, Commissioner, I had a question about the price gouging. Um, can you tell us if the number has the number gone up, or have they come back? Have they settled? So I so there were there, there were weeks during the, the the you know the intense period of the pandemic where we were getting between fifteen hundred and two thousand complaints in a week. The number has gone down significantly, and I believe is the result of uh, us having a presence in the field and reminding businesses about you know, this rule, make sure that, again, consumers had access to these products that they needed to stay safe and healthy, right? So the numbers have, numbers have gone down significantly. I believe that we were getting maybe just a handful of complaints a week, um, but um, I, I hope that uh, the issue has been addressed. Okay, good. And in, in regard to the, um, the financial uh, empowerment partners, so there's six, there's six contracts citywide, is that it's seven yeah. contracted groups, seven. but they operate 35 centers in throughout New York City neighborhoods. Okay, and all all 35 providing um, free uh, tax preparation services. This cycle? So that the um, the financial empowerment centers do the financial counseling and coaching, right? And then the other program is the free tax preparation services. For that one, we have 15 contractors providing those services. There are some cases in which it is one, one group doing both, right? They have contracts to do both programs. Um, but uh, the, the 15 um, contracted free tax preparation services uh, organizations operate, I believe right now about 40 something that are, um, located have a physical location have you seen an increase in the demand because we're seeing a, a significant increase in the demand in this office for that type of service which is pretty unusual well i think that what is happening and and, and i'm sure you, you you've heard about this too that uh, you know the economic stimulus payments right are, are going to be given to families who have filed their tax returns in the past right and so we certainly have seen uh people who who want to, to do these returns. And um, I, I think it's also partly that um, a lot more individuals are now choosing to use this program. Uh, in the past, we still had a lot of New Yorkers using the page tax preparers. Um, so, so the demand is there. I believe that because we're providing services in a number of ways, such as in-person and virtual services, a lot of the in-person appointments have actually been filled out, I mean, filled up. Um, so we do encourage New Yorkers to not delay, don't wait until the last minute um, because people are taking up those appointments quickly. And how are you handling the, the, the virtual? Because I, I think that, that that's the issue is that what we're seeing here, and I don't know if this is a trend that you're seeing as well, is that uh, many of the folks that are coming in here are either a little bit older or uh, don't have access to internet services, don't know how to use a computer. And so they're, they're really nervous about doing it virtually, even when we are offering a computer at the office, um, they just, they don't understand that, that, that process, right? It, this is all really new to them. Many of us have had, you know, almost a year, if not a whole year to prepare, right? And to become kind of acclimated. But for them, this would be probably, you know, um, for some of them, the first time, uh, you know, doing something like this virtually. And I think, you know, people think about their taxes as a pretty you know, serious enough issue that, you know, they would rather do in person. So I, I, I understand the, uh, the, the, the constraints, but I wonder, like, is there anything that we're doing differently to, you know, to maybe increase the number of appointments or open up, you know, additional sites if necessary to ensure that, you know, individuals who don't have access, um, are, are still able to to see someone in person. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it was a, an issue last year, right? During the pandemic, as you know, the tax system got extended through October almost um, because of the significant problems with people accessing uh, services for preparation of taxes. Uh, and so what I would say is that right now, I believe we have nine providers who have physical sites. So it's, you know, it doesn't mean nine physical sites, it's just nine of the organizations that may, may have different physical sites. I think we have about 40 physical sites. Um, the problem is that, you know, um, 
well, it's not a problem, but in response to the pandemic, right, we do need to make sure that we are taking time between clients so to disinfect the area, right? We, there's all these constraints about how to make sure that is still like a, a safe way to access these services. Uh, but I, we would love to talk to you and think about other ways in which we can make sure that seniors are taking advantage of this program. We do work closely with AARP, and I believe there's another organization, I forgot the name, that um, has been working with our office to make sure that we are addressing the concerns of seniors and we're figuring out ways to be more accessible to them. Yeah, I think one of the ways that you can help the senior population is also by um, better educating them on the fact that, you know, certain tax forms like the NYC, you know, 210 um, is a form that can easily be filled out and completed uh, for free. And I think that, you know, we've seen uh, a, a number of cases where uh, seniors have been charged upwards of $15 to complete the application. Um, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's shameful that this continues to happen, but I think that, you know, that it happens. And so we have to recognize it and, and maybe work with our senior partners to, uh, to ensure that they know uh, to look out for this and to, 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 you know, share information with their constituency as well. But I think, you know, in my, my, my concern is that in, in communities like mine, which were, you know, largely impacted by COVID, where we saw a lot of job loss and you know just a lot of changes that resulted as a as a result of the of, of the COVID um, pandemic, that I have seen a you know an increase in the number of in person visits um, for this specific issue. So you know I know that we don't have, there's not much time left right before the filing deadline, and I'm concerned that we just don't have enough appointments to really meet the demand. And I don't know if that's something that. Uh, is being monitored and if there has been time or there is enough time to kind of adjust and, you know, bring on, you know, more people if necessary, make more appointments available. Obviously, we can't extend the filing deadline, um, but are there things that we can be doing or should be doing in the process to, um, to ensure that all of those that need the service are receiving it? Because at this point, you know, I, my concern is that, you know, that may not be happening based on what I'm seeing at my office. I'm, I can only speak for myself, I, um, but I just, you know, wonder if you have been receiving any, you know, calls or complaints um, from people that don't, you know, haven't been able to access an appointment so far. Well, I, I'm not aware of, of complaints about that, but, but I do know that we've been telling people that the appointments have been filling up very quickly because uh, you pointed to all the reasons for that, right? Um, uh, you know, we are part of a, of a network, again, that goes beyond our contracted providers uh, that, um, you know, get together to look at the IRS updates. And as part of the, this network of, of groups, uh, we also have the IRS, our IRS partners in the group. And so we will advocate, uh, and I, I know that, well, well, right now the filing bit, that link is April 15th. I obviously think that we could use with an extension, right? This is this is going to be a year in which, you know, still we are still trying this virtual programming and it's still challenging to, to many individuals with uh, literacy issues, especially with technology. So um, we will continue to advocate in our role of, as an agency protecting consumers for a, potentially an extension of the filing deadline. Um, and we'll continue to, th to think about how to address this, these issues of uh, access. Yeah, we definitely want to work. Uh, you know, I, I think I appreciate what you're saying, Chair, and I want you know your colleagues to to also heed that that same advice in terms of like tell us what you're hearing on the ground. You you know your constituents best, um, and report that information back out so that we know where we're best to strategically um, deploy our outreach and have uh, kind of virtual presentations with folks, as well as um, you know in some cases kind of be on the ground as well. Um, I will say that, you know, in terms of like how we've adjusted over the years, we, we've certainly made adjustments to how we're advertising this program. As a result of COVID, we've skewed advertisement and marketing towards digital uh, ads. We've definitely uh, made a renewed commitment uh, to, um, to uh, posting advertisements in ethnic media as well. Over about 40 to 50% of folks that use free tax prep report that their that their uh, primary language is not English. 
So that informs in turn how we're picking and who we contract with to provide services. Right now, uh, our contractors are selected based on their ability to serve diverse communities. It informs the fact that our, our uh, uh, in many cases, our ads and certainly our collateral and tax preparers themselves speak over around 14 different languages so as to meet the need. Um, but ultimately, you know, a collaborative process is, is key. So tell us what you're hearing and we'll definitely deploy resources accordingly, but we definitely have recognized um, the COVID impact. Um, and I think as the commissioner was alluding to, we've also made very clear, not only will uh, folks that, that fall into the appropriate income bracket save money, their own money by, by, uh, by doing uh, free tax prep services, but also these services are critical to ensuring that you're able to get these, uh, these stimulus checks and know uh, whether you qualify uh, and how much you'll be getting and when and things of that nature. So we've skewed our talking points accordingly to really um, you know, catch folks' attention um, when, we, when we're interacting with them. Perfect. Um, now, I think this is my, my final question regarding the um, regarding the 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 sidewalk cafe. So the 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 legislation requiring the city to waive and a refund um, any consent fee, uh, fees for undisclosed sidewalks uh, cafes expire this month. Are you expecting to resume? Um, Here. To resume collecting fees, I'm sorry. So we, we did work with council and administration to refund uh, close to $12 million on, on consent fees, right? Right now, the program has been suspended um, pursuant to an executive order from the administration. Um, and um, there are just for context about 1,300 sidewalk cafe licensees uh, compared to over 10,000 that participate in the open restaurants program, right? No, understood, but the, but, but the legislation expires at the end of this month. So are we, are we expecting to start collecting fees again next month? Well, I believe that right now there are ongoing discussions about making the open restaurants program permanent. Mm -hmm. So what you know will happen to the Taiwan Cafe licensing program, I think is still up for discussion. Uh, from our perspective, we obviously, as an agency, um, you know, we advocate for the simplest, most easy to access program for New York businesses. So uh, we don't know yet uh, whether um, there will continue to be a sidewalk cafe license or not. Uh, those are discussions that are happening right now. Okay. All, right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And again, you know, if, if the, the council would love to be sharing and help in any way that we can, so if there's anything that we can be helpful with, please let us know. It's always a pleasure to have you come join us. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you for all of your support. And thank you uh, for your continued um, you know, thinking on these issues on how best to serve New Yorkers. We really appreciate your leadership. And we have a lot of work in the next few months. So. We do, yeah. Thank <laughs> you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin delivering your testimony. Mm -hmm. I would like to now like to welcome Mohamed Atia to testify, followed by Karina Kaufman Gutierrez and then Jennifer Tosik. Mohamed? All right. Um... Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Council Members. Uh, my name is Mohamed Atiyah. I'm the director of the Street Vendor Project Center. Uh, the Street Vendor Project is a membership-based organization working to improve the working conditions of the approximately 20,000 vendors who sell food and merchandise across New York City. SVP was founded back in 2001, strives to improve and expand vending as a viable employment option for immigrants, uh, military veterans, and other entrepreneurs in New York City. As the only organization that focuses on 
founders in New York City through direct legal representation, small business development and trainings, uh, organizing support, leadership development and strategic advocacy. We have connected nearly 3000 street vendors to resources and information about housing, food access, loan and grant in the past year long. The Street Vendor Project requests support from the New York City Council to further develop and expand the essential multilingual we offer to street vendors, an estimated population of 20,000. These vendors are our city's smallest business owners who provide affordable food and merchandise to New Yorkers. Vendors have special needs related to the mobility of their businesses. Additionally, it can be very difficult to stand just due to the language and residency status and other barriers. In January of this year, New York City Council marked legislation in 1116, reforming the entire street vending system, such a system that is very complicated and very challenging to understand. Uh, many agencies and many enforcement agents uh, leave alone the average street vendor. The news of the bill uh, has excited street vendors the city who are eager to apply for a supervisory license and become part of the formalized economy. SVP staff members are fielding hundreds of calls to advise vendors as the only organization that focuses on street vendors in New York City. Our services were already in high demand throughout the COVID-19 as we connected nearly 2,000 street vendors to resources and information about several services. Uh, vendors across the five boroughs reach out because of our long history working with the community since the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated New York City street vendors, many of whom are undocumented, have seen up to a 90% loss of income in their daily lives. This high volume of intakes has presented an unsustainable demand of body and the organization, hence our urgent request of support to increase our ability to respond. With the increased need to inform of the updated rules and regulations and the new system and the response to uh, the urgent COVID-19 related needs, SVP requests support capacity for our culturally and linguistically specific outreach services across the five border. SVP proposes to hire outreach and specialists who will conduct outreach to vendors across the five boroughs and a variety of engagement methods with each of the positions focused on one most common languages spoken by vendors, Arabic, Bengali, Mandarin, Spanish, and Wolof. Additionally, the education and outreach specialist will work with graphic designers to create uh, linguistically specific materials as well as materials for the literature population. To monitor any progress, the education and outreach specialist will document and track their education and outreach efforts by collecting vendors' demographic information and uh, of the bill and the resources needed. Uh, finally, the education outreach specialist will work with SVPs uh, to create those materials, make sure that vendors understand uh, the new system, the new vending system, make sure vendors can comply and have a better vending system across the city that will make it a lot easier for the enforcement agency to enforce these laws. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Mohammed. Next, I'll be calling Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, followed by Jennifer Tossig, and then Justina Ramakan. Karina? Good morning. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Karina Kaufman Gutierrez and I'm the deputy director at the Street Vendor Project. Um, so colleagues with Mohammed, who you just heard from. As you mentioned, um, SVP is the only organization in New York City that works with street vendors directly. And with a staff of six, we have really been the only place where thousands of street vendors reach out to um, for everything from education, on street vending rules and regulation to small business development, loan and grant applications, registering for tax IDs, filing sales tax forms, legal representation, immigration assistance, and leadership development. So to say we are the one-stop shop for street vendors is really, really quite the case. Um, 
vendors across the five boroughs do reach out to us because of our long history working within the community and because we know the intricacies of the vending system. Um, today, we are requesting support from New York City Council to further develop and expand the essential multilingual services we offer to street vendors who are our city's smallest businesses who keep our who, who are providing fresh, affordable food all across the five boroughs and, and really looking out for the community as well as the eyes on the street. Um, we, again, as Mohammed mentioned, our services have been in high demand throughout the COVID-19 crisis as we've connected just within the last few months, nearly 3000 individual street vendors to resources and information about housing, food access and loan and grant opportunities. Um, again, with the increased need to inform vendors of updated rules and regulations, as well as to continue to respond to urgent COVID-19 related needs, we are requesting support to expand our capacity for our culturally and linguistically specific outreach services across the five boroughs. Um, and in addition to providing ed extended education and outreach, um, we are hoping that um, the outreach and education specialists that we would be able to hire with extended funding, we'll be informing vendors about two of our different critical resources. One is a small business consultation program, and another is an environmental justice initiative. So with our small business consultation program, um, which we kicked off earlier this year to help um, vendors not only recover from COVID, but grow their businesses um, and be part of the formalized economy, we are equipping people with tools, resources, and skills they need including information about um, uh, how to build credit, financial literacy, business legal services, and again, connecting them to microloans as well that they would be eligible for. Um, uh, this is in addition to the work that we've already been doing to connect, to help vendors um, create e-payment systems, develop social media, personal finance management, and marketing. Um, additionally, um, with our environmental justice initiative, we aim to reduce the environmental footprint of our city's growing fleet of food carts and trucks, while both uplifting and supporting the crucial role that vendors play in some of the most impacted communities. Um, with this program, we are working to help vendors adopt waste management practices that reduce solid waste, minimize the use of foam and plastics, and maximize recyclable and compostable items helping the city to achieve its goal of zero waste by 2030. So we, to, to close, the outreach and education specialists will really be a vital part of the effort um, of both the environmental justice initiative and ensuring that vendors are in compliance um, with updated rules and regulations for vendors um, by providing this, this critical information and connection and continuing, um, continuing to expand the work we've done as an organization. So thank you so much for your time and, and happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Karina. Next up, we have Jennifer Tossig, followed by Justina Ramlikan and then Autumn Weintraub. Jennifer? Hi, good afternoon, members of the New York City Council. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tausig, and I'm testifying today as the co-chair of the New York City Bid Association. I'm also the executive director of the Jerome Gunhill Bid in the Bronx, and thank you for holding this hearing today. The Bid Association represents 76 individual bids throughout the city that serve as stewards of our diverse commercial corridors and neighborhood public spaces. Our mission has always been to support the almost 100,000 local businesses we serve to keep our neighborhoods clean and safe and to bring prosperity to our communities. Never has our work been more vital and essential than it has been during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are pleased to present testimony today on the Department of Worker, Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection's proposed budget. First of all, we would like to thank Commissioner Salas and her team for being responsive to the city's bids and maintaining an ongoing dialogue with us. As our city begins to recover from this awful pandemic, we must support our small businesses and help them regain their footing. We hope that DCWP will work with the administration and city council to continually look at outdated or unnecessary fines and violations that only hurt our business owners who need a helping hand right now. We also know that DCWP will soon begin rulemaking on the new just cause termination legislation. How the agency implements this incredibly and burdensome new law will have a major impact on hundreds of locally owned restaurant franchise owners. We hope that the agency will consider their pleas and ensure they're given all the time and support they need to comply with this new law. Lastly, 
DCWP will be also be charged with rulemaking and implementation of the new vending legislation, which will add over 4,000 new vendors to our city streets. Our brick and mortar small businesses are struggling to survive now more than ever, and they are extremely concerned about both the lack of any enforcement on existing vendors and the impact of new licenses being issued. The city's bids call on Mayor de Blasio and the city council to fully fund the newly established Office of Street Vendor Enforcement to ensure a level playing field for storefronts and vendors alike. The Bid Association estimates an annual budget of $8 million or more for the Office of Street Vendor Enforcement is necessary to ensure adequate staffing capability to perform citywide patrols and enforcement actions in its first year of operation, or at least to give the city give the agency a hope of engaging with the estimated 20,000 street vendors in our city. We sincerely hope that the council will include this request in their budget response and make this a priority. Thank you to the city council and DCWP for your partnership and we look forward to working together to help New York City's small businesses and commercial corridors recover. Thank you, Jennifer. Next up, we have Justina Ramlikan, followed by Autumn Weintraub and then Luisa Mendez. Justina? Hello, my name is Justina Ramlikan and I am a political organizer with SEIU Local 32BJ. I would like to testify in support of providing the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection with greater funding. 32BJ is proud to have championed many of the laws overseen by DCWP. This goes beyond the Fair Work Week law, which covers not just fast food, but also retail workers, and includes paid safe and sick leave, the $15 minimum wage, rights for freelancers, and protections for displaced building service workers. We've also worked with DCWP to enforce these laws. Their hard work has led to major victories from which thousands of working New Yorkers have benefited. For instance, in September 2019, DCWP filed a lawsuit against Chipotle for over $1, mil, uh, excuse me, $1 million in restitution for workers and continued their investigation as workers at dozens of more Chipotle restaurants have brought forward complaints. DCWP has also successfully negotiated settlements on behalf of more than 1,000 workers with some of the nation's largest fast food companies. In two recent settlements with major airline contractors concerning the city's paid safe and sick leave law, DCWP has been able to recover $30,000 for the city and an additional $138,000 for hundreds of workers. While DCWP has been able to secure these amazing victories for New, New Yorkers, by increasing their capacity, the city can truly enforce the wide scope of these laws. For instance, DCWP is responsible for enforcing the Fair Work Week law at more than 2,600 fast food establishments and beginning this June rolling out the new Just Cause law. Further, they are responsible for protecting the rights of more than 3.4 million private sector workers covered under the paid sick and safe leave law. We need more investigators to enforce the various worker protection laws. We need more appropriate resources and funding to make the process faster and make workers whole sooner. This is especially concerning given the critical importance of paid sick leave amidst the ongoing pandemic. By investing in labor standards enforcement, the city is not merely providing critical protection to many of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. It is also investing in its communities as workers with access to stable, good jobs are less likely to be in or close to poverty or rely on public services. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Justina. Next up, we have Autumn Weintraub followed by Luis Mendez. Autumn? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, committee um, and chair. Um, my name is Autumn Weintraub, and I am the director of SEIU Local 32 BJ's Fast Food Worker Organizing Program. I'm here to testify in support of providing the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection with additional funding. Uh, to that end, I'd like to speak about the critical role DCWP plays in supporting labor standards in the fast food industry and other industries citywide. The last 12 months have changed our lives in ways few would have thought possible at the outset of the crisis. Fast food workers have spent this long year on the front lines of the COVID pandemic, fulfilling essential work, not just to provide for their families, but to feed our city. The work has not been without its toll. A recent study found that in California, line cooks experienced a higher increase in mortality rates 
over their pre-COVID level than any other occupation. Within New York City, the racial distribution of fast food workers parallels the trend of COVID having disproportionate impact on communities of color. As of 2016, 54% of New York City fast food workers were Black or Hispanic, populations that have seen higher rates of per capita COVID deaths than any other racial or ethnic group. Nearly four years ago, the council made a commitment to fast food workers that they would have access to stable schedules and a path to full-time hours by passing the Fair Work Week law. Since this law went into effect, DCWP has done an incredible job working to enforce these standards with the resources that they have. More recently, the council passed groundbreaking just cause legislation, making New York the first city in the country to protect fast food workers against unfair firings and reductions in hours. These protections are a huge shift in industry where fully two thirds of workers report having an employer fire them without even providing a reason. Taken together, these laws have the incredible potential to tra transform fast food jobs into careers that can sustain New York families and communities by providing stable full-time hours, as well as job security. This potential can only be realized, however, if DCWP has the resources it needs to ensure that more than 2,600 fast food establishments in New York City are following these critical labor standards. In passing just cause amidst the pandemic, New York City sent a bold message that we will rebuild our economy by protecting essential workers, not by, not by sacrificing them. We ask that the council stand by its commitment to funding DCWP so it can make these laws a reality for all fast food workers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Autumn. Last up, we have Luisa Mendez. Uh, Eduardo, I see you are present, but is Luisa prepared to give her testimony as well? Yeah, so Luisa actually had to get off the call because she had to go to work, but I, I could give Luis, I have Luisa's testimony here. So I could read that real quickly. Um, so yeah, so my name is Eduardo Zavallos. I'm an organizer with 32BJ, so Luisa's testimony. Um, so my name is Luisa Mendez, and I work for Chipotle Mexican Grill at their Union Square South location in Manhattan. I'm here to ask the city council to give more money to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. In October 2019, I called out of work several times to care for my pregnant daughter, my father who was hospitalized with a heart condition, and myself as I felt sick as well. My GM told me I was calling out sick too much and then fired me. Chipotle did not rehire me until February 2020 after DCWP investigated them for breaking New York's paid sick leave law. I'm grateful to the DCWP for the work they did, but the process still took five months, during which I had no income. Then last March, my husband, my daughter, my son, my, and my father, all of whom I live with, got sick with symptoms matching coronavirus. Starting on March 16th, I took a leave of absence to make sure I didn't expose anyone else to the virus, not knowing how I was going to pay the bills. It was, it was a difficult position to be in. Although Chipotle had promised to provide two weeks of paid sick leave for workers out due to coronavirus, when I asked, it, when I asked about that, my GM just told me to take unpaid vacation time. It ultimately took me several attempts of reaching out to different Chipotle managers and hotlines before the company paid me the two weeks of sick leave. The coronavirus pandemic makes prompt enforcement of paid sick leave all the more important, as even amidst this crisis, we cannot trust our employers to do the right thing. My father ultimately passed away from COVID-19. Uh, the lack of income added stress to the tragic situation. We had to make arrangements for my father's burial and pay, and pay for it while struggling to keep my family fed and housed. Even when I returned to work, that stress did not go away. Though I used to work 30 to 32 hours a week, Chipotle cut my hours down to 14 to 16 hours a week for no reason. This made it harder and harder to pay bills and ultimately forced me to take a second job. I'm overjoyed that the city council passed the Just Cause Bill, which seeks to protect against exactly this kind of situation, but that law has to be enforced. Chipotle and other fast food companies employ tens of thousands of New Yorkers, many of whom have experiences similar to mine. The more DCWP is funded and able to do its job, the more the industry will comply with these laws. Coronavirus has taken a terrible toll, not just on my family, but on those of so many other essential workers. Please give DCWP the funding it needs. Thank you for your testimony, Eduardo. That concludes public testimony. 
If we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in the order that your hand was raised. Seeing no hands, I will now turn it over to Chair Ayala to offer closing remarks. Chair, I think you just have to unmute. Here. Yeah. <laughs> I was having a hard time getting unmuted today. Uh, thank you. I want to thank all of the advocates for coming. Commissioner, isn't that beautiful how much support you have? <laughs> I don't remember sitting on a hearing where so many people came to support the, the organization. So thank you know that that speaks to to your work um, and, and your commitment to helping some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. So thank you for that. And I, I really do recognize that. And I'm really happy to be uh, chairing this committee in particular because I am a fan of you know, uh, DCWP's work, um, but I really wanted to also thank um, the advocates because, you know, your, your work and your leadership on, on these issues really help us, you know, uh, do our jobs uh, to the best of our capacity. So thank you so much. And I, with that, I think um, ha there's no one else um, scheduled to speak. So with that, this meeting is closed. Thank you.